Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. So, Tier 2 Russia today, and a huge amount to get through. Tier 2 actually has the highest amount of tanks in a single tier in the entire game, so loads to cover. As this video is nearly as long as a feature film, please feel free to watch it in parts. There should be timestamps in the comments if you'd like to skip ahead to a particular vehicle. Also, thank you guys so much, as we recently hit 30,000 subscribers, which is a number that I never imagined this channel would get to. So, thank you all so much for sticking around and watching these videos, it really, really means a lot. Anyway, without any more delay, let's get into the video. As always, I really hope you enjoy. So, first off today, a very new addition to Tier 2, the T-50, which is a very mobile, fairly well-armoured light tank that after six years has been moved up to Tier 2 from Tier 1, which means it can now function as a proper light tank with active scouting abilities. It's equipped with the same 45mm cannon found in Tier 1, with access to APCR as well. So, for a light tank, it's fairly well armoured, having 40mm of armour all around pretty much on the hull and turret. This means it can sometimes bounce the weaker cannons you'll come up against in the lower tiers. If you angle the hull, you can buff the armour to around 70mm of effective thickness, which is pretty good, but in matches above 3.3BR, the armour stops being hugely reliable. Any cannon over 50mm in calibre will commonly be able to get through no problem. But overall for a light tank, it is undeniably well armoured, and of course, can't hull break either. Its mobility off-road is pretty good, uh, but not so much incredible. It's slower to reach a high speed than the BT series of tanks, but it will still cruise at around 40 kph off-road, which isn't really bad at all. The main drawback of the T-50 though is the lack of turret traverse. Stock, it can only turn at 4.8 degrees a second, which is really, really poor, especially for a vehicle that relies somewhat on mobility. As if you're pushing into the map, you're going to need to react quickly to enemies on your sides, and the T-50 will struggle to do that a little bit because of the lack of traverse. It's not a huge disadvantage, but it's definitely enough of one to periodically catch you out. Because of this, you're going to want to avoid brawling to an extent, as the lack of traverse will really hurt the most in these engagements. You're really going to want to avoid spots where enemies could appear on your rear or sides. Of course, don't let this put you off from fighting at close range entirely, but just be more aware of your flanks than you would be in any other vehicle. As for its general playstyle though, I'd suggest something similar to the BT series. Push into the map on the offset, and try and knock out enemies pushing into the caps. And remember to use your scouting ability too, as the T-50 is the first tank in the tree that can use it. Also, look at the BR you're playing at as well. At 2.7 to 3.0, your armour is a little bit more reliable, especially the hull armour, so playing it out of cover is a bit more viable as the majority of enemies can't reliably get through the front plate. At 3.3 and above though, if you want to play it a bit safer, try playing hull down, as you'll start seeing tanks that can easily cut through the front plate, and they will one-shot you if they do. The turret is a fairly small target to hit, so if you do go up against these tanks, playing a bit more sneakily like this is likely the way to go, as even if you can't penetrate them, you can scout them for your team, allowing you to get into an aircraft cheaper. All in all though, the T-50 is fairly versatile for a light tank. As long as you avoid close range brawling, you can just play it in a way that suits you. It basically plays like a slightly slower BT with a lot more armour. Pros, great mobility, decent armour, and versatile. And the cons, slow turret traverse. What's our verdict? Well, i definitely go for this one, as really you're going to need a light tank for the lower BRs here, especially if you're a new player that likes getting into close air support. The T-50 is useful and versatile, and if you can overcome the slightly underwhelming cannon and turret traverse, you'll do very well. So, next up is the first in a series of what might be some of the most legendary tanks in the world. This is the T-34 Model 1940, and despite being the earliest model in the research tree, it's still very, very good. The 1940 is equipped with the 76mm L11 cannon that can fire APHE and AP rounds. Generally, the stock APHE is the round to go for, as it does huge amounts of damage and will generally have enough penetration to get through most of your enemies. The reload is comparatively long though, at 9.3 seconds stock. Basically every German, American, British, well actually basically every common gun has the potential to out-reload you. But this really is its only drawback directly regarding firepower. Mobility is pretty great for a medium, it can cruise around in the high 40s off-road and can turn, reposition and reverse very, very easily on basically all terrain. Armour as well is pretty fantastic if you know what to do with it. The armour on paper isn't hugely impressive, but because of all the other assets the T-34 has, you can artificially buff it in a few ways. 
The front plate is 45mm thick with an effective thickness of around 75mm. The turret front is 45mm thick as well, same with the angled sides, it's 45mm all over really. And this means you can safely angle the hull pretty effectively, which will negate a fair few cannons around this BR. Now, the armour of this tank follows the same principle as basically all tanks this tier that rely on armour, so I'll cover it in detail here. This is something I've brought up a lot before, so apologies if you heard it already, but the armour of the T-34s is made so effective by the window of reaction time that it gives you. The most effective way to buff your armour when fighting an enemy is to angle the front plate and keep moving, either drive forward or reverse or flick between the two. Enemies will have no trouble getting through your armour if you're completely still, they can just aim for your turret or unangled front plate and cut right through. But, if you angle and keep driving, this essentially makes the best spot an enemy can hit you constantly change. The effectiveness of your armour relative to the enemy is always changing if you're on the move. So if you are manoeuvring and an enemy is preparing to take a shot at you, one of two things generally happens. Either they fire without really thinking and therefore not aiming for a weak spot, likely resulting in a non-pen, or they take too long trying to aim for the weakest part of the armour which will usually give you enough time to fire back at them. The T-34's design is almost perfect for taking advantage of this. I appreciate the explanation might be overcomplicating it a bit though, uh, so basically just keep it in your head that when you're engaging an enemy, you need to angle your hull and you need to keep moving. Don't stay still and give them an easy shot. So many tanks in the Russian tree can rely on their armour by using this principle, so practice it as much as you can. It will take a fair while to perfect, but when you do perfect it, you'll really notice the results it gets you. As for using this version of the tank specifically though, one of the bigger problems you'll face is up tiers, as the gun, despite doing a lot of damage, generally will start to struggle against certain enemy vehicles, especially the American Shermans. Much like a lot of the previous cannons though, this gun is great against angled armour, so if you see one of these tanks slightly angling, try going for the side armour as chances are the round will sneak its way through. As the APHE shot has 150 grams of explosive filler, you basically just need to penetrate a tank anywhere to knock it out. So if you are struggling, just aim for the weakest part of armour possible, and if you don't manage to knock out the tank in a single shot, you definitely will cripple them. The only other thing to keep in mind is the T-34's lack of gun depression. So you mainly want to be playing on flat ground, or at least avoid the high ground, as positions like this will likely make you quite vulnerable. Apart from that, the tank really just plays itself most of the time. It's almost perfectly suited to the game really. You can brawl, snipe, and everything in between. If you can perfect the defensive manoeuvres, it will fit perfectly into whatever playstyle you prefer. Pros. Good firepower. Good mobility. Good survivability and versatile. At the cons, poor gun depression, and comparatively long reload. Verdicts, pointless, get it, <laughs> of course. It will be made redundant quite quickly by the later T-34s, but it's a really good place to start out. It might suffer a little bit in up tiers, but generally it's a fantastic vehicle and a really great start to the line. Next up, another T-34, the 1941 variant. This version carries over most of the exact same assets as the previous model. The armour layout is functionally the same, there's a few differences but nothing hugely noticeable, and the mobility is basically identical too. The only major change is the firepower. It uses the same calibre of gun, but with a longer barrel and better penetration across the board. This version also comes with two APHU rounds instead of one, and choosing which one to use is really the only extra aspect to understanding this tank. The A version has lower penetration but lots of filler, and the B version has more penetration but less filler. Both rounds respectively are pretty decent and both will work. Personally I use the B round, as the extra penetration does definitely help out sometimes, especially at range, and to be honest, it still has just under 100 grams of explosive mass, which is good enough to one-shot most tanks you'll fight anyway. So I would recommend you use the B round, but if you do prefer the extra filler in the A round, that will work just fine. There's no wrong answer. Apart from that, there's not a huge amount I can really add upon to the 1941. I'd recommend that you play it almost exactly like the 1940. The armour still works in the same way, it's functionally identical. The turret mantlet is a little bit different, but nothing that'll really affect how best to use it. This version can also get unlockable track armour protection for the size of the turret as well, which can sometimes help protect you against shots coming in from odd angles, although it's not really consistent. All in all, just play it how you play the 1940. Pros, great firepower, good mobility, good survivability, and versatile. And the cons, poor gun depression, and comparatively long reload. Verdict, 
I'd get this one too, easily. It's a great machine and takes away the main disadvantage of the 1941 model, which was situationally the lackluster cannon. This one will do just fine with dealing with basically any enemy. So just keep angled, keep on the move and click first, and you'll do perfectly fine with this tank. Next up, we have the 1942 model, and this one does change things up a little bit. It uses the same gun, but with two extra types of ammunition, an APCR round and a heat round. Both generally aren't very effective, but it's a good idea to take a couple of heat rounds once you unlock them, as they will generally trigger a hull break. The reload is also slightly shorter as well, down to the redesigned turret. And speaking of the turret, it comes with some armour advantages and drawbacks. The turret face itself is fairly well protected, as the bumps either side of the turret face act as spaced armour, meaning that these bumps in tandem with the actual turret armour behind them offer a total of around 100mm of armour protection if a shot lands in that area. Also, as it's hollow, it can also act as a trap for some APHE shells as well. However, this turret has an exposed neck. The gap underneath the turret itself is fairly large and quite weak at only 53mm thick. The problem with this is that there's no way at all to hide this fairly large weak spot. No matter where you position yourself or what you do, the neck will always be a reliable place for an enemy to hit you. The armour on the hull though is largely the same. It does get some better add-on track armour and the driver's hatch is 75mm thick instead of 45 which will protect you if you get hit there. Because of this, when you're angling your hull towards an enemy, try and angle with the driver's side towards them, as this makes it a bit more likely that they'll hit the hatch. Brawling though is perhaps a little bit less reliable in this version just because of the neck, but the previous strategy of staying on the move of course will help out. And as well, because of the neck weak spot it's even more important to drive at an angle if an enemy shooting at you don't drive right at them, as if you do, the weak spot on the neck won't change position, it will just get larger relative to the enemy. If you drive at an angle, the enemy then needs to compensate for the lead as well as the drop, which will make it a bit harder for them to hit the weak spot. Because of it in general though, you might consider playing at a slightly further range, or even playing hull down maybe. The turret armour isn't amazingly consistent, but it is the most reliable block of armour you have, and if you can entice enemies to shoot your turret face instead of the neck, you'll likely survive a bit longer. Of course, at longer ranges, the neck is still a weak spot, but it is harder to hit, especially if you're moving. So, this is still an option. Apart from that, not much else on this variant is different. The reload is shorter, but still not really fast enough to reliably outpace anything you fight, so you will still need to be careful at close range. Its mobility is basically the same. It is in fact a little bit slower than the previous versions, though not really by much, you'd hardly notice. So, there's not really much I can add here without retreading ground. So, pros, great firepower, good mobility, good survivability, and versatile. And the cons, poor gun depression, and constant weak spots. Verdict! I would still definitely get this one. Despite the weak spots, it does work very well still, and the slight buff to the reload does help. And the extra rounds give you a little bit more viability if you need it. So, just keep on the move, and you'll do great. Next up is the last T-34 in the research tree today, the T-34E STZ, which at 4.0 is again quite different. All the main changes are in regards to the armour this time around. The turret has a slight redesign, making it a bit more angular in spots and reducing the frontal surface area, which will sometimes trigger more bounces. The most impactful change though is to the frontal hull armour, which gets an additional 15mm plate, which covers basically all of the flat parts of the hull. This might not seem like a big buff, but it really does add up. As long as you're not at point blank range and if you angle, the German 75 and American 76 can't get through the front of the hull anymore, which is a really big advantage if an enemy doesn't take the time to identify which model you're playing. Unless a round hits the machine gun port or one of the small unarmoured parts, it most likely won't penetrate. Apart from the armour though, it's standard T-34 stuff really, the reload is the same as the 1941 9 second stock, and the mobility is basically the same as well. Despite the buffs to the armour, you might actually need to be a little bit more careful though. As this thing is 4.0, it will more commonly see up tiers than the previous versions. Even in up tiers, the hull armour will still be able to hold up, but it's the aspects of the firepower that might start to hurt it. At common combat ranges, this round does struggle against the Shermans a fair bit, and as every nation now has their own number of Shermans, they become one of the most common vehicles at this tier. And for the T-34, they are quite a hard vehicle to counter. If you are fighting them, always try and look out for angled side armour as that's where you want to hit. The side armour of the Shermans is fairly weak so the APHE can easily sneak through. If you're at very close range you can get through the front plate but it will start to get a bit harder past around 500 metres. The armour piercing round you can equip can get through the front plate a bit easier but just bear in mind that it doesn't really do a lot of damage. So if you do end up taking it out, try and shoot through the hull into the gunner if you can. 
Also, as we mentioned before, be careful of your reload, as if you're brawling and miss, the enemy easily has enough time to push you. And as you're likely going to be fighting stronger vehicles, try and avoid the extreme close ranges, a few hundred meters or so. If you make a mistake in this vehicle, you will get punished for it, so try and play at a distance or in a location that won't let enemies push you if you bounce them. Playing at this distance has another advantage as well, in that it's a little bit harder for an enemy to identify that you're playing the up-armoured version and might just shoot your hull, as really you're going to actually want enemies to shoot at your hull, so maybe even angle less, pretend you're making a mistake, present the front of the hull to an enemy for an easy shot. Of course, angle a little bit for safety, but in my experience, I've found that in doing this, enemies will still try to shoot through the hull, which is really what you want, as they most likely won't get through. All in all though, it doesn't change up the formula that much, just play this one a little bit more carefully, and it still will do well. Pros? Good firepower. Good mobility. Good survivability. And versatile. At the cons? Poor gun depression. And comparatively long reload. Verdict. I'd still get it. It will still work at its battle rating and will be a decent backup for a while until you unlock the next set of mediums. I'd say both the STZ and the 1942 are both valid options to use as a higher tier backup in their own ways, so whichever one of those you prefer is ultimately what I would recommend. Back to the lower BRs next, with the T28 medium tank at 2.0. And for 2.0, this thing is fantastic. It uses a 76mm cannon that comes with a rubbish shrapnel round, but a brilliant APHE round, which functions a lot like the APHE round the T26-4 uses, but with around double the penetration. This cannon does huge amounts of damage and will generally one-shot anything it penetrates. Mobility is sort of middle of the road really, not super quick, not terribly slow, it's sort of a comfortable in-between. It gets where it needs to go easily enough. The base armour protection though isn't that great, but much like its older brother the T-35, its survivability comes from its crew count and spaced armour. The little machine gun turrets act quite efficiently to catch incoming shots, but only if you angle, which you should definitely always be doing in this tank. The base armour thickness is only around 20mm on the turret, so even some heavy machine guns can cut through this thing. So, if you're engaging an enemy, try and angle so that one of the machine gun turrets is pointed towards them basically. This won't always save you as an enemy isn't always going to be shooting the blister, but as you're commonly going to be running into newer players, it will protect you from time to time. As for playstyle though, as long as you're careful, it does sort of play itself. You can't rely on the armour, but you can quite comfortably rely on the gun once you unlock APHE. It can take out anything, basically. The main struggle is just going to be the first few games where you just have the shrapnel shell. When you're stock, aim to use the shell a little bit like the round the T26-4 uses. Aim for the weakest part of the armour regardless of the angle, as it will likely be able to get through. Once you unlock the APHE though, you're pretty much set. This is one of those tank tanks, just like the T-34s really. The armour will save you sometimes, the gun is great, and the mobility will allow you to maximise the potential of both aspects. All you really need to do is just remember to keep angled, and you'll do fine. Pros, great firepower, decent mobility, and versatile. At the cons, unreliable armour. Verdict. Get it. I'd say this is a great pick for your first tier 2 tank, as it is quite forgiving, and once you get it upgraded, it can really be a monster if you're not up tiered too harshly. It is a bit of a struggle stock, but well worth sticking with until you reach the T-34s. Next up is the T-28E, which shares basically everything in common with the previous version, apart from the armour. The E is coated in additional 30mm plates, protecting the turrets and some parts of the hull. The driver's hatch and lower plate also have 20mm armour plates protecting them, so all of this extra armour brings the average overall thickness to around 50mm frontally, which for 2.3 isn't bad at all. It'll definitely make it harder for some of the weaker cannons to reliably get through. It does however take a hit to mobility though, and is a bit slower to accelerate and manoeuvre, and as such its top speed is also lower, although this doesn't really change much to how it plays. Overall, the armour isn't majorly consistent. At 2.3 it's going to see a lot of up tiers, and it will run into tanks that can easily cut through the armour, which in turn makes the hit to mobility a little bit more of a problem. At its own battle rating though, it'll work great. If you can aim to enter engagements at mid-range, you're safe from auto cannon fire and some of the weaker cannons as well. At close range, the armour is easier to get through for enemies, so try not to get too close if you can help it. In terms of playstyle though, it's essentially the same as the previous T28, it can do basically everything. Although, if you have it in a 2.3 lineup, I would only really play it below 3.0, as above that it does lose a lot of its advantages. You can still undoubtedly do well, but it won't work quite as consistently, and you do have better options for up tiers, which we'll get into soon. Pros? 
great firepower, decent survivability, and versatile. At the cons, unreliable armor. Verdict? I would consider this one, not in terms of its ability, but just down to how viable it is in lineups. There's a great 2.3 lineup this tier, and if you plan on making one, I would definitely say the T28E is worth getting. Although, if you just want to push to the T34s, you might as well skip this one, as it won't really fit in anywhere and doesn't work amazingly when up-tiered. Have a look at the lineups at the end, and if 2.3 seems appealing, then I would go for it. Next up, another legendary machine, the KV-1. One of Russia's most successful heavy tank designs, and in-game it is very functional too. It's equipped with the same L11 cannon as the first T-34, with the same ammo options as well. Mobility for a heavy tank is pretty decent, it can turn and manoeuvre quite easily despite its weight, but of course, the main factor here is the armour, and the KV-1 has some of the most reliable armour tier for tier in the game. It can be really effective. Its overall thickness everywhere generally is 75mm. The turret, hull and sides are all 75mm thick, which do give it huge potential for angling. When angled, the hull can become close to immune from every common gun you'll fight. The German 75 can't get through at most ranges, and none of the short allied guns can either. And of course, if you employ the same tactic as the T-34s, staying on the move and driving back and forth, a lot of enemies will really struggle to crack your armour. You always want to be angled in this thing, as if you're front on and stationary, at 3.7 most enemies can cut right through the flat armour of the hull. So it is very important that you stay on the move. The KV-1 is fairly versatile though, in that it has advantages at every range. At long range the armour can be very very hard to get through, but the lacklustre performance of the cannon will start to show, and at close range you should be able to penetrate most of the enemies you'll fight, but of course it will be a bit easier for enemies to get through the armour. In max up tiers at 4.7, the KV-1 definitely does suffer. It'll start seeing allied heavies and the up-armoured German tanks and a lot of vehicles that really will give it some trouble, but it does have the advantage of being 3.7 with the T-34s and a tank destroyer that we'll get into next time. Because of this, if you go for the T-34s first, you can just play them in the up tier instead, as they commonly will perform better. The KV-1 is at its best where it can completely rely on its armour, and it does become a little harder to do that above 4.3. So if you're up against some tough vehicles, it'll probably be a better idea to leave the KV-1 as a backup. Below that though, it will perform quite consistently. It also has a few extra degrees of gun depression compared to the T-34s, so it can be a bit more viable on uneven terrain as well. Wherever you choose to play the KV-1, it will have some sort of advantage, armour at range and penetration at close range, so you basically have the potential to maximise the effectiveness of whichever asset you find the most important to your playstyle. If you're not as confident, relying passively on the armour is probably going to be a better fit for you, but if you know the tanks you're fighting, you can afford to play a bit more aggressively if you're careful. If you're about to take fire and you're on reload, try angling the turret as well as the hull as this will present a very tricky shot for an enemy to hit. In this position, they can only really go for the turret ring or the rounded bulge by the mantlet, which, if you're on the move, are still very hard targets to hit. So basically, if you play it a lot like the T-34s and don't make yourself play in up tiers, you'll have a great early heavy tank to play around with. Pros? Decent firepower. Great armour. And versatile. And cons? suffers in up tiers. Verdict? Get it, definitely. It won't always be a good choice on certain maps and battle ratings, but it does fit brilliantly into the 3.7 lineup and lets you potentially have some fantastic games if you can make yourself a hard target to hit. It might take some practice, but the KV-1 once upgraded can be great fun. Next up, another heavy tank. This is the KV-1S which is actually fairly different to the regular version. The S designation just means fast, basically, and this version really is. It's a bit slow to accelerate, but when it gets up to speed, it can cruise with the T-34s even. Its mobility is much more like a medium tank. Its reverse gear can also let it travel at 17 kph in reverse, which is hugely useful for a heavy tank. So overall, the mobility is great. Armour though does take a little bit of a hit, not a massive one, but still enough to make it not quite as reliable as the previous KV. The side armour loses 15mm of protection, making it only 60mm thick. You can still angle the hull to make it nearly immune, but at close range some of the stronger guns will start getting through. The redesigned turret is a bit of a mixed bag in terms of armour. Some parts are weaker and some are stronger. 
It's around 82 millimeters thick and doesn't have so much of a pronounced turret ring, but as it's rounded, it makes it a bit more vulnerable from different positions. It does have some overlapping parts and will still bounce shots from time to time, but you will still need to drive back and forth and use the same armor tactics to really make it work. Firepower as well is improved. Functionally, it uses the same cannon as the later T-34s, although it can't fire heat. So, the KV-1S is probably one of my all-time favourite tanks. Every asset this tank has works. The armour can save you, the gun works great, and the mobility really lets you get the most out of both of those assets. This vehicle is a heavy tank for players that don't like heavy tanks, as it really isn't held back by the mobility at all. Because this tank is so universally capable, I can't really give you a set, solid playstyle as it will just work wherever you like. Like the previous KV though, at close range and long range you have notable advantages, but this time around the gun is a lot more powerful comparatively, so you can play it reliably at further ranges and it will generally still do fine. Again, it will struggle against the Shermans, but at least this time around you can mostly shrug off their shots. Enemy cannons with around 100mm of penetration will really struggle to penetrate you unless they hit weak spots. So because of this, I'd avoid trying to play it at extremely close ranges, as all this does is make your armour slightly easier to get through. If you do find the gun struggles at range though, you can of course take it to the closer ranges, but just be aware that it will be a little bit more vulnerable here. All in all though, it's just so capable that it will work wherever you most feel comfortable playing it. Pros. Good firepower. Good mobility. Good survivability. And versatile. And the cons. Poor gun depression. And comparatively long reload. Verdict. Get it. I love this tank very much, almost like a son, and I'm sure that you will too. It's forgiving in the right places, and when spaded, has very effective mobility and a gun that will generally still work very well. It's a great versatile heavy tank that has a lot of advantages. Just remember to keep it angled, and it will all just click into place. Next up is another light tank, the T-80, which was the successor to the T-70, and as such comes with a few in-game buffs. As it's tier 2, it can scout, and as it has an extra crew member in the turret, it can reload incredibly quickly. This T-80 has one of the fastest base reloads for a single-shot cannon in the game, at 3.3 seconds stock and 2.5 seconds on an ace crew, so this thing can fire off shots faster than everything, potentially. The turret is also redesigned, and despite being of a slightly lower thickness, it still offers decent protection down to the many harsh angles of the turret. A lot of the low caliber guns will still struggle to get through quickly. The hull though is a little bit weaker as the driver's port is more pronounced and flatter, so a shot into the port will likely one-shot the tank, so much like the T-70, try and angle yourself to dissuade enemies from shooting at the driver's hatch. And again, if possible, angle the engine side towards the enemy as the engine will still catch some shots. And speaking of the engine, it is slightly more powerful, but due to the increased weight of the T-80, the tank overall is slightly slower. Not by much, but it is noticeable. So, a fair few upgrades and downgrades for this one. Directly compared to the T-50 this tier though, this thing is more of a support light tank. So, less of rushing into the map, and more so sticking with the team, scouting enemies, and being a little bit more passive. The T-80 unfortunately inherits some of the more annoying traits from the T-70 as well, the slow turret traverse and the very bouncy suspension, meaning that it can't really be consistently aggressive, as the characteristics of the turret will artificially limit your reaction times when you meet enemies on the move. The best spot for this tank really is playing around an active area of the map, either a cap point or commonly travelled route, so try to get to a decent spot and stay still if you can. If you can find a location that works and you do this, you can easily take out a lot of enemies. This tank on a good crew can fire faster than every enemy potentially, so all you really need to do is find a spot you're comfortable with and the gun will just do the rest really. The penetration might start lacking a little bit, but as you can fire so fast, even if you miss, you can fire off another round in no time at all. Pros? Very fast reload and decent firepower. And the cons? Unreliable armour, and poor weapon handling. Verdict? Despite the tedium that comes with it, I would still get this one. It does fit nicely into the 2.3 lineup, and if you can get it into a good spot, it can work incredibly well. Just try not to be too aggressive with it, as playing it this way can catch you out. It's not going to be a tank for everyone, but it definitely does have its moments. 
Next up, a fan favourite, this is the Zis 30, a fairly primitive tank destroyer on the chassis of a tractor. The gun it uses is pretty good, it's a long 57mm cannon, which can get through a max of 145mm of flat armour, which is really great. It comes with two rounds, one has slightly better penetration against angles and at range, and the unlockable round has slightly more filler. Both work perfectly fine in their own areas really, but I would personally use the unlockable K round once you get it, as the extra filler will help sometimes as the base TNT equivalent in this round is quite low. Its mobility isn't hugely impressive, but decent enough. It can turn and maneuver easily and can get to good spots in the map when upgraded without too much trouble. Armour isn't worth going into really, just imagine you don't have any at all. Light machine guns, cannons, anything can pose a threat to you really, and of course it can also hull break. So, all this vehicle really has to rely on is the cannon pretty much, and at 2.3 it can rely on it fairly well. It's a bit inaccurate at long range and has only 20 rounds, so it's not flawless, but it will get the job done around this BR easily enough. There's very few vehicles that this thing will actually struggle to knock out. Generally, if you aim centre mass, you'll knock out most tanks without too much trouble. As for where best to play it, there are a few things to consider. Firstly, keep the lack of gun depression in mind, it can only depress to minus 2 degrees, which really isn't enough to use a lot of the high ground. I would also try and avoid playing it at really close range and really long range. At close range you're obviously a lot more vulnerable and easy to hit, especially against artillery, and at long range you are much safer, but the gun can be quite inaccurate and as you only have 20 rounds, missing a few will cut down your potential and, as well, notify enemies of where you are. You definitely can play at extreme ranges, but as the inaccuracy of this gun for the most part is out of your control, playing it at mid-range might give you the most longevity and potential. Another aspect to the ZIS-30 is its size and to an extent shape as well, in the sense that it doesn't actually look like how a tank in this game generally looks. If I asked you right now to close your eyes and without thinking too hard about it picture a tank in your head, it probably wouldn't look anything like the ZIS-30 which does extend into gameplay as well. Because it doesn't look like a tank and is quite small and narrow, you can remain unseen in areas where other tanks wouldn't, mainly in bushes and hedgerows. This thing doesn't really stand out and you can definitely use bushes for cover way more consistently. Of course you're not going to be invisible by any means, but you might find tanks will just drive right past you at the lower ranks. So you can afford to get a little bit closer to enemies using the various floor around the map if a sniping spot isn't readily available. Just remember to keep repositioning after you fire and knock out enemies, as they will probably be coming back in a plane to strafe you. Pros, great firepower, and decent mobility. And the cons, poor survivability. Verdict, I'd go for this one. It's not very forgiving at all, but it is fun to use and works well beyond its tier as well. This is a great tank to use in up tiers as the gun will still work great. Just be a bit more careful with where you choose to play it and you will get some decent results. Next up is the SU-76M, another TD at the same BR as the ZIS, that offers an alternative as such. The gun this tank uses is functionally the same as the F-34 cannon on the later T-34s, it can use both APHE rounds and comes with all the later rounds as well, heat, smoke and APCR, which at 2.3 this time around is actually really good. You have rounds available to easily deal with any enemy you might fight. Despite being an open topped vehicle though, the reload is still quite long at 9 seconds stock. Much like a lot of tank destroyers, this thing's firepower is really its only reliable asset. Its top speed is only 30 kph, which is really quite slow, uh, but it can turn and maneuver on the spot easily enough. Armor wise, it's again nothing impressive really, 25mm frontally and 30mm on the lower plate. Although interestingly, it can't actually hull break, so that is something. As it lacks any reliable armour and mobility, finding a perfect spot to play this thing in is quite difficult, as in engagements, firepower is the only active advantage you have and armour and mobility very much support the firepower aspect. Mobility allows you to get to a good spot and the armour keeps you in the fight longer, but as you don't have any mobility or armour advantages, this vehicle becomes quite difficult to consistently use and has nothing it can passively rely on. This is all basically a pretentious way of me saying that there's no spot where this thing will consistently work well. I would recommend though that you do play it at the longer ranges, as that way you are a little bit harder to hit. The gun will still hold penetration with the APHE over long range and is still quite easy to aim as well. At close range you'll of course most likely see more enemies, but the chance of you getting hit and disabled is very very high. This thing doesn't have a fast reverse gear either at only minus 5 kph, so if you do get caught out you likely won't be able to retreat and repair, especially considering as most of the guns around this BR fire very quickly. I'd also try to stick around some lateral cover, trees or buildings will do. This thing is very weak to aircraft and as well a larger target than the ZIS, so if you're seen by a plane it will easily wipe out your crew. 
I'd really just aim to watch a cap or sight line from a stationary position at range, standard stuff really, as this will put you in a comfortable middle ground which will keep you alive the longest and still let you see enemies to shoot at. You're very very vulnerable out of cover and on the move, so if you can stay still and still be able to engage enemies, that really is the best spot for it. Pros? Great firepower. And the cons? Poor mobility. Poor survivability. And low versatility. Verdict? I'd consider this one. It will work really well if you know some good spots on the map to play in, but if you're still relatively new to the game, you'll likely do better using the ZIS-30. The SU-76 has no passive advantages to help you out, and it can be a bit tedious to use, especially stock with no mobility upgrades. Because of this, I'd personally recommend you go for the ZIS, but if the extra firepower this thing offers is appealing, you might still get some good results in it. Next up, something fairly different, this is the SU-122, a casemate tank destroyer housing a 122mm howitzer, which looks more dangerous than it actually is. It can fire a high explosive round which can get through 37mm of armour, and a low velocity heat round which can get through 160mm of armour, and it can also fire smoke as well. But its reload though is very, very long at 23.6 seconds stock, meaning that almost every enemy you'll meet will out-reload you. It's even slower than the German 150mm howitzers by comparison. Armour-wise, it's not really that impressive either. It's 45mm thick at a weak frontal angle. The majority of common guns around this battle rating will have no problem getting through. Some of the earlier weaker guns will probably struggle, but it's not really even close to being consistent protection. As this thing is on the T-34 chassis though, it is fairly mobile. It can manoeuvre and cruise around at a decent speed. Although, the problem is that this tank can't safely use the mobility to any good effect. Because the reload is so long, you can't afford to push deep into the map because you don't have the reload speed to fire off rounds quick enough to fight off multiple enemies. And even so, the performance of the cannon really isn't that impressive. In a 2.0 to 3.0 game, you'll hardly have any problems, but this thing commonly fights 3.7 and above, and frontally with your HE, you will struggle to take out Shermans, Cromwells, and even some of the up-armoured Germans. The heat rounds generally will get through these tanks, but it doesn't really do consistent damage, especially against the Americans and Germans, as their crews are quite spread out within the tank. So in most cases, it'll take two shots to knock out a tank with heat, which will be around 40 seconds in which you're dedicated to taking out a single enemy. The high explosive round does have a higher chance to one shot in my experience, but it requires a more precise shot, generally hitting the side armour or just below the turret, as this generally will send fragments down into the hull to blow up the ammo. The overall problem with this tank, though, is that the performance of the cannon isn't worth all the drawbacks it has. The armour is fairly superficial above 3.0, the round is fairly hard to aim accurately, and the reload is very, very long. I'd say that both of the previous tank destroyers in this line actually do this thing's job better. They don't really have any armour, but their guns do work, even at the battle ratings this thing fights in. They have much higher one-shot potential and consistent damage, and can fire much, much faster. I can't deny that blowing tanks up with a huge HE round is fun, but in regards to this tank, it's just so unreliable and can be quite frustrating when you make a shot you think is perfect just to have it lead to a non-pen, followed up by a 20 second wait. As for actually using it though, I tend to stick around cover and watch a sightline at mid-ranges, usually poking around a corner so I can retreat into cover while on reload. With this tank, mid-range is sort of the best of both worlds, as if you're too close, you might miss and an enemy will easily have enough time to push you, and if you're at long range, the gun might become a little bit too tricky to aim, which isn't fun as if you miss you'll of course have a really long wait. It also definitely helps to stick with your team, this isn't the tank that works well on its own. If you aim at the turret of an enemy tank, you might not knock them out, but you will likely blow their barrel off, which will make it easier for your teammates to finish them off. It's a good idea to try and stick with a tank on your team in general, just to have the passive support of their presence, which, hopefully, uh, will be beneficial to you. It also does help to know exactly where to shoot at enemies. With HE against the Germans, either shoot at the bottom of the turret or the cupola, as this will likely wipe out their breach and turret crew. For the British and the Americans, try and fire just below the gun barrel, as this will either cripple the crew or blow the barrel off. Although, for these nations, it's best overall to main the heat round if you're against them, as the HE can be quite inconsistent. In a perfect world, you'll want to disable the tank's ability to move and fire in one shot, but if in doubt, just go for the turret, as if you do hit them and miss the breach, they're just going to be able to fire back at you before you reload. Pros? High damage potential. And the cons? Inconsistent firepower. Long reload. Poor survivability and low versatility. Verdicts. I would honestly avoid this one. I know it looks fun, 
but in practice you'll rarely get consistently good games in it. I'd go as far as to say that you'd be putting a hard limit on your potential as a player by choosing to play it over any other vehicle at around 3.0. If you do actually end up taking it out, just count how many engagements you lost that you definitely wouldn't have lost if you were using any other vehicle. This thing could more than fairly be 2.7 or even 2.3, but of course they'd never actually do that as there's already two tank destroyers at 2.3. The only way this thing can fairly be improved is by dropping the battle rating or shaving a few seconds off the reload, and I'd say that either of these would be fair additions. But even then, I'd still say you would be harming your performance by choosing to take it out. In any case, there's plenty of better vehicles to focus on getting. Next up are our anti-air, and there are actually a fair few to look at this time around. We're starting off with the Gaz MM-72K, which is a truck that carries a single 25mm cannon mounting on the back. Everything else is pretty standard for a truck, great mobility and no armour, not much else to really add there. The cannon itself though is pretty good, and more so actually against tanks. The AP round it uses can penetrate 55mm of armour, which is actually really good, considering as well that it doesn't have a reload, it can just keep firing until the gun overheats. It's not amazingly accurate though, but the volume of fire you have will easily cut through most of the tanks you'll come up against. As far as actual anti-air potential goes, it's not terrible, but hardly outstanding. The inaccuracy makes hitting aircraft a little tricky and the dead zone of the cabin can be annoying for tracking aircraft flying around you. It's also a little bit harder to get the lead as well in my experience, it just doesn't lead like most anti-air in the game, so it will take a while to adjust to. When you do eventually get the hang of it though, it will take out aircraft in a few hits. At its battle rating of 2.3 though, this thing chiefly excels at going after tanks. 55mm of penetration is enough to take out basically anything from the side and, well, to be honest, most tanks from the front as well. It can easily find its way through weak spots like turret rings and knock out barrels and tracks as well. It also has the mobility to be able to be hyper-aggressive and capture enemies out. You can just rush right into the map as a first spawn and just pick a corner or piece of cover to hide behind and take out enemies from the side. The only thing you need to be careful with is running into enemies completely head on, as of course, if they're straight ahead you can't fire through the cabin. So either avoid roads or areas of the map where you could run right into an enemy, or drive around at a slight angle and just zigzag up roads, as if you do see that an enemy is coming, you can just swing around quickly to the side and train the cannon on them. This is how I try to go after tanks anyway. This thing really does have the potential to catch a lot of enemies by surprise. As for actually using it as its design purpose as an anti-air, uh, I can't really give much advice, just stay protected on the ground, stick to your spawn, and if possible try and angle yourself sideways to an incoming aircraft, as this way if they fly over you, the cabin won't get in the way when you swing the gun around. Pros. Great mobility. Great anti-tank ability. And decent anti-air ability. At the cons. Poor survivability. Verdict. Get it. Definitely, I'd say this thing isn't quite as good against aircraft as some other vehicles this tier, but its anti-tank ability alone makes it well worth using. You might need to employ some careful positioning, but you will get those games where it all just clicks into place and you will really rake in the kills. For 2.3, it really is great. Next up, our second anti-air, the BTR-152A, which is a post-war armoured transport, and this particular version comes with twin 14.5mm KPVT machine guns. On the surface, these might seem a little underwhelming, but they do work quite well. They have high velocity with a fast fire rate, which makes them much easier to aim than most anti-airs. The rounds themselves are pretty decent too. They're mostly a mix of incendiary and armor-piercing incendiary, which is really the best of both worlds. These guns can easily penetrate aircraft armor to get the pilot snipes, and also get into and set fire to the engines quite easily as well. The unlockable armor-piercing belt also gets access to a cement core shot, which can get through a max of 45mm of flat armor, so you can use it to take out some lightly armored tanks, and even some mediums from the side. Although, it isn't hugely consistent, as the rounds are fairly low caliber, they need a really flat angle to get the most out of their penetration power, and you'll commonly run into tanks that you'll have no way of penetrating realistically, so it's not really quite as viable as a tank. Tank hunter. Its other general assets are pretty much what you'd expect though, no armour and decent mobility. As a playstyle, if you choose this one, I'd mainly just recommend you use it purely as an anti-air vehicle. You're best off just staying in cover in your spawn. If you do find yourself being engaged by a tank or even aircraft, try turning yourself sideways. This thing has five crews spread out throughout the vehicle, and if you turn side onto an enemy, they have basically no way of knocking out all the crew in a single shot. Whereas if you're presenting yourself head-on, a round through the middle of the vehicle will likely completely cripple you. So do keep this in mind as it can sometimes save you. And as well, like other vehicles that use a magazine, when you only have a few rounds left, fire off the remaining rounds to reload a fresh set, as you don't want to be caught on reload. 
As for belts to use, they all work pretty adequately against aircraft. I personally take the AP belt just in case I run into a tank, as the belt itself still does great damage against aircraft. Pros, great anti-air ability. And the cons, poor survivability and mediocre anti-tank ability. Verdict, I would get this one. It's not amazingly great against tanks, but it's much easier to use against aircraft. I personally find it much more user-friendly as someone who isn't good at anti-air. So on that basis, I recommend you consider using it if you just want a pure anti-air vehicle, as to be honest, it's going to be the most reliable anti-air for a while yet. Finally, our last anti-air, the ZIS-1294 KM, which is an incredibly fast truck that comes equipped with twin 25mm guns, the exact same as the first anti-air. Not much really changes regarding this vehicle as the guns are identical, so I'd go for exactly the same tactics when going after aircraft and tanks alike. This version is genuinely a lot faster and more responsive though, it can outpace most light tanks off-road, and as such can be used to rush caps or push far into the map to get some early side shots. It does have the same dead zone with the cabin though, so like the earlier Gaz, make sure you're not driving into the map in such a way that would mean you'd run into enemies head-on, as they will just machine gun the cabin and disable you. At 3.3, the guns work fine against enemy tanks. They'll struggle with the allied tanks frontally, but you can still get through the turret rings of German Panzer IVs, even from the front, so you can be pretty effective against Axis vehicles. Despite the extra spread of the gun, I'd say this thing is still a bit harder to aim against aircraft than the BTR, but much better at attacking ground vehicles. So whether you want to take it out as a first spawn and be aggressive and try and catch some enemies out early game, or just use it as an SPA, it will in its own way get the job done. Pros good anti-air ability, good anti-tank ability, and great mobility. At the cons, poor survivability. Verdict. I get this one too. Even though it's just one BR jump away from the BTR, they're both worth using respectively. They do different things well. So if you think the potential to go after some tanks would be beneficial to you, this thing might be a better choice. But if you just want an easy anti-air vehicle, I would stick with the BTR. Regardless though, they're both very viable options. Next up is the extensive list of premium vehicles this tier, and first we're going to briefly cover those that are sadly not available at the moment. Starting off, this is the T-34 prototype. This tank was an original pack for the closed beta test of War Thunder's ground forces, alongside the German Sherman. It's very close to being identical to the Model 1940 in the tech tree, although it is a tiny bit faster. Not by much, but it is noticeable. It also has a lamp. This tank sometimes goes on sale for a limited time around certain holiday events, we recently just had one. Although it was being sold as a collectible really, which was around the price of a top tier premium, 60 euros or so. Unless you really want every vehicle in the game, it's not really worth spending that money for a lamp, basically. Currently it's not available, but it will probably pop up again next year if you really do want to buy it. Next up, another unobtainable vehicle, the T-34 First GV TBR. This was one of the first packs for Russia when tanks came out, but has since been removed from the store. It's essentially a 1941 model with a special winter camo and some very small changes. It uses a later turret, which is slightly more rounded at the front and may bounce some more shots, though it's hardly a buff. And the driver's hatch as well is slightly thicker at 60mm instead of 45 on the tech tree version. And as well, it doesn't get any add-on track armor. All in all, it'll function basically the same as the one in the tech tree, so you're not really missing out on this one. Next up, Probably one of the most unique playable vehicles, the BM-13N Katusha. It's basically a truck with a load of 132mm rockets, which are pretty powerful with just under 5kg of explosive filler each, and the ability to blast through 40mm of armour. This vehicle was given away for an event a few years ago after completing a challenge, and as it's one of these gimmicky rare vehicles, it'll more than likely pop up on the marketplace at some point. In what form and at what average price, I can't really say, but I think it'll definitely be a reward for something in the future. As a vehicle, itself, it's not really that functional to be honest. The rockets do loads of damage if they hit, but the rails on their own actually can't depress, so you'll struggle to hit tanks even directly in front of you. You can dampen the suspension though in order to depress the rails, which does help, but this does make you very vulnerable as you can't move in this state. It's actually pretty much the weakest vehicle in the game really, with only two crew and one millimeter of armor protecting them, so a single machine gun bullet into the cabin will knock it out. It's a nice hangar collectible, but not really much else. It can be a bit of fun though, so when it pops up again, it will be worth unlocking. 
Next up is the Mark IX Valentine, a Lend-Lease British medium tank. For 3.0, it's not a bad machine. It has a fast-firing 57mm cannon with good damage and armour that holds up for the most part around the BR. Interestingly though, it's one of the only tanks that doesn't actually have a machine gun present. This specific vehicle was aptly on sale for the last Valentine's Day for a few hundred golden eagles. As such, it will most likely be available for purchase next Valentine's Day as well, as a rare collectible sort of thing. It's a fairly decent tank, I quite like the Valentines, but it's not an insanely useful grinder, and plus identical version is present in the British tree if you want to play it yourself. Next up is this ugly duckling, the Mark II Matilda, a British heavy tank modified to carry the 76mm F96 cannon in the turret. It functions basically the same as the later T-34 cannons, although it doesn't get heat or APCR. Armour-wise, it has around 75mm of protection on most parts of the hull and turret, with some weak spots on the tank here and there. It's incredibly slow though, and can only reach around 24 kph maximum, and on top of this it only has minus 2 degrees of gun depression which really, really hurts its performance on uneven terrain. This Matilda is a past event vehicle and basically unobtainable at this point, well, unless you have around 180 Gaijin coins lying around, as at the time of writing only three of these vehicles exist on the marketplace at very high prices. It will possibly come back at some point in the future in some earnable form, these vehicles sometimes do, but I can't say either way really. It's a nice little collectible, but not really an immensely fun vehicle to play, it can be quite tedious, so you're not really missing out on much. Next up is the T-34E, which is another up-armoured variant. The base model is a 1941, but with additional high-hardness rolled armour on the turrets and sides. This actually gives it a fair bit of extra protection, as high-hardness actually has a higher modifier, so basically they have a higher effective thickness against incoming rounds. As these extra plates are placed on the side of the tank, this means it can angle even further than all the other variants, making the hull close to immune from most of the guns you'll fight. As it is 4.0 though, it does suffer a bit when up-tiered, and is also a fair bit slower than the other T-34s as well, with a lower top speed and acceleration which will catch it out. This tank was initially one of the starter pack vehicles for Russia, but has been gone for a long time now. It's currently on the marketplace in very limited numbers and currently holds a price for around 90 Gaijin coins, so it's only really worth it as a collectible at this point. You're not missing out on too much though, the STZ and the tech tree basically can do the same job, so you can just put a talisman on that and functionally get the same product. Next up is the BT-7 F-32, and as you can probably tell, the main addition here is the change in firepower. This variant uses the F-32 cannon, which performance-wise is basically the same as the L-11. It can fire the same rounds as the F-34 cannon though, but the penetration is slightly lower. But for 3.0, it's not really bad at all. It of course features the very impressive BT-7 mobility, so it can get around the map very very quickly and use the cannon to good effect. This thing is a great light tank really, and has so much more longevity compared to the T-50, mainly just down to the cannon. It can knock tanks out from the side and even the front pretty easily, and really is the star light tank this tier. It is annoyingly a marketplace vehicle in limited supply however, and is currently on sale for around 12 euros, which is fairly expensive for a tier 2. At that price, I wouldn't really say it's worth it as a grinder, as your money can be better spent, but it is worth it relative to its performance as a vehicle. This BT-7 works very very well as a light tank, and has a bit more potential than the T-50 in that role, as the turret drive is a lot faster, and of course down to the gun as well. I wouldn't say it would be a mistake to buy it at this price, but there are better value premiums down the line that you could get for less money. So, if you want to be a little bit more conservative with your wallet, you may as well skip this one. Even though, functionally, it is really good. Next up, an absolute copy, this is the SU-76M 5th Guards Cavalry Corps. It comes with a couple of unique decals and a bicolor camo, and that's about it really. It's currently on the marketplace for around 10 euros as a collectible, so it's not really worth getting. Also, I am selfishly going to use this opportunity to vent a little bit about a story I have uh, regarding when this tank was first available. A fair few years ago, in an event, you could earn it over a weekend potentially, where for every 50 kills you got a battle trophy that could contain the vehicle, uh, or some silver lions or backups or anything like that. You could unlock a total of 20 boxes, which meant a thousand kills. Over that weekend, I actually got a thousand kills, and the tank didn't drop, and I was very upset about it, because I'm a child. Anyway, I hope they never do something like that again, it was awful. Uh, but yeah, carbon copy, not that functional, only go for it if you're a collector. 
Next up, our last marketplace vehicle, the SU-85A. This is the first vehicle BR-wise to use the legendary 85mm gun, and its performance around this battle rating is fantastic. Nothing at this tier can survive a shot from this cannon. It won't really struggle with anything. Apart from the gun though, its performance is fairly unimpressive. It shares the same chassis as the SU-76, and basically the same armor layout. It's slightly different, but won't really save you against any incoming shot. Mobility is a little bit better than the 76, it can reach a max of 40 kph instead of 30, so it can potentially get around the map a little bit easier. Regardless of the drawbacks though, the gun is devastating enough to make it worth using. We'll go more into the 85mm gun next time, but generally it's fantastic. The SU-85A is a past event vehicle, and at the time of writing, it's on the marketplace for around 8 euros, so it's still fairly cheap, and at this price I would actually recommend it if you really want a premium this tier. It's not amazingly easy to use, but it does have the most important asset for a premium, and that's viability in an up tier. This thing's cannon, even at 8.0 and above, will still work perfectly, so you can always take it out and have the potential to knock out enemies. If you're somewhat confident with the maps, this vehicle would be a decent choice. It is in limited supply though, so expect the price to eventually creep up. If you can pick it up for below a tenner, it would be a nice addition to a lower tier lineup. But there are still some better premiums in the later tiers, so if you want to be a bit more conservative with your money, you might as well hold off on this one. For the current price though, it certainly wouldn't be a waste to pick it up. First for our GE premiums is the T126, which might look a tad familiar. This is one of the T50 prototypes, and despite actually looking similar, it performs quite differently. First of all, its armour is really improved, having 55mm of armour on the frontal hull and 45 on the turret and sides. If you angle this thing slightly, you can get the hull armour to around 90mm of effective protection, which is great. This can even bounce the German 75 sometimes. However, Despite still being designated as a light tank, this version is actually quite slow. It has an absolute top speed of only 35 kph, which isn't really a lot for a light tank. Regardless though, it is still quick to accelerate and maneuver, although it doesn't really have a good reverse and can only reach minus 4 going backwards, which makes backing out of an engagement fairly tricky. So, this thing doesn't really function as a light tank. It lacks the mobility to flank hard around the map, and still has terrible turret traverse like the T-50, so it's not really that viable for the playstyle. It is a bit more consistent at brawling though, if you angle slightly, barely any tanks around the battle rating can get through the hull, so it definitely has the armour to play here. Overall it's more like a medium tank really. At a price of 850 golden eagles, it's not too bad at all, but I'd say that the T126 doesn't really have that much longevity. It lacks the speed to work as a light vehicle, so you can't really play it like one in higher BRs as it's just too slow to reliably work there like the T50 can. Its main selling point is really the armour, and at up tiers, despite its armour being good, it can't be made entirely reliable. This means that the 126 will be made redundant quite quickly and won't have a meaningful place in your lineup for long. It's really, really good around its own BR and will work there well, but as a product, it's just not viable to use much beyond its own battle rating. It can still sometimes work in up tiers well, but I don't really think it's entirely worth it. It's still functional for what it is, and I wouldn't go as far as to say it would be a mistake to buy it by any means, but there are better premium vehicles later in the tree that you will definitely get a more effective use out of. Next up, a fairly unique vehicle and one of War Thunder's only premium anti-air vehicles, this is the ZUT-37, which, to be honest, is a dreadful anti-air, uh, but situationally a fairly good tank destroyer. It doesn't have an electric turret drive, so you can't really track aircraft very well. You can certainly take them out, but it really is quite tedious to play it in that role. For a tank hunter though, it's actually not bad. The 37mm cannon comes with clips of 5 rounds, and a maximum penetration of 71mm, which is fairly decent for 2.7. Although, the reload is comparatively quite long at 6.5 seconds stock. Mobility though isn't too bad, it's about as fast as the T-80 this tier, and uses the same hull as the T-70. However, its survivability isn't really that great, as it has a very weak turret, only two crew, and can hull break as well, so overall it is fairly vulnerable. It works best in a similar position as the T-80 and T-70 series, covering a heavy area from a stationary position. As the gun is quite unstable, and as it has no electric turret drive, reacting to enemies on your sides will still be quite tricky. All in all though, it is a thousand golden eagles, which for the sort of vehicle that this is, isn't quite worth it. It isn't a large amount of money by any means, but this tank is quite niche and vulnerable, and because of that it's not going to be a hugely consistent vehicle to use for grinding. It can definitely be a bit of fun for the lower tiers, but if you're just after a tank for the extra research, this one isn't really the best choice. 
Lastly, for the tanks today, we have the SMK, a huge heavy tank with two turrets. The main turret houses the L11 76mm gun, while the front turret is equipped with a 45mm gun, which isn't too useful at 3.7 and above, and mainly really just functions as spaced armour. Speaking of, this thing's survivability isn't so much that great. The turrets all around are 60mm thick, with the frontal hull being 75 and the sides being 60 because this tank is so long, you can angle it a fair way and bring the effective thickness to around 100mm on the hull, which is great, but the Achilles heel of this tank is the base of the turret. It's entirely rounded, meaning that from any angle where it's visible, it's effectively flat. This means you can't angle the hull because it gives the enemy a perfect shot into the base of the turret, which is also exactly where the very large ammo rack is kept. Because of this, you can't reliably in any way buff the armour by angling. If you keep it head on, the front plate is vulnerable, and if you angle it, the turret is vulnerable. So, there isn't really anything you can do. I would say staying head on though is basically the most reliable as it's quite hard to one shot frontally, which overall isn't so much of an advantage, but it is probably the best option you've got. In the grand scheme of things, this tank doesn't really have a huge amount going for it. The gun and the armour is fine around the battle rating, but in up tiers it will start to struggle a lot. It'll no longer be able to rely on anything. Not the armour, not the mobility, and not the cannons. And as well, it basically does the same job as the KV-1 and the tech tree, but worse, so really the best option here is just the talisman and the KV-1, as at least you can actually buff the armour quite nicely. For 1,300 golden eagles, it's still quite cheap, but doesn't really have much longevity and won't always be suitable on certain maps and BRs. And as that's out of your control, you can't guarantee the game will put you in a situation where the SMK is viable, and for that reason I'd recommend you skip this one. If you do like the heavy tank playstyle, I would just recommend you Talisman the KV-1, or save your money until the next tier. Next up are our cast planes, and we have some truly legendary examples this BR, and we're starting off with the earliest iteration of the IL-2, the 1941 model. These planes are of course by design almost perfectly suited to the close air support playstyle. They're armoured enough to withstand light machine gun fire in critical places, they're also surprisingly agile enough to fight some aircraft and loop and dive on enemy tanks, and can carry a complement of incredibly effective armament. This version carries two 20mm cannons that can rip through the top armour of any tank around this battle race. It can also carry four internal 100kg bombs that drop separately, and carries some new rockets, our S-132s and our BS-132s. Same as the rockets in the first episode, the RS are high explosive, and the RBS are APHE. The RS rockets this version uses though are pretty good and packed with HE filler. This rocket will easily hull break and can cut through 40mm of armour, so with the lower tiers, the rockets this thing uses can be really dangerous. If you're not super comfortable with rockets in general, I'd say go for the loadout of 8 RS-132s as they will do considerable damage. The APHE rockets are even more devastating this time around, but I would say at the lower BRs the HE rockets are the way to go. Overall, for 2.3, the IL-2 is probably the best CAS aircraft out there, it does absolutely everything it needs to do well. Next is an upgrade, the IL-2 Model 1942. This version has the same ordnance loadouts, but comes equipped with new cannons, the YVA 23mm guns. With armour-piercing rounds, these guns can cut through 37mm of armour maximum. At the range you'll be strafing tanks, this penetration will be closer to 30mm, but even so, these cannons will tear up anything you strafe. There's basically nothing around this battle rating that you can't rip through. I really cannot recommend these planes enough, they're genuinely perfect for the job. It may take a few games to unlock the weaponry upgrades, but even then the guns will still work against tanks, and especially aircraft too. So if you couldn't tell already, I really recommend spading these planes. Next up is a premium, the P40E1. It's a fairly decent fighter on the offset, but can also carry bombs and has possibly one of the most underrated weapons for close air support, and that's 50 cals. It carries six of these heavy machine guns and can easily penetrate the roof of basically all enemies that you'll fight, all the while having bombs too. If you'd prefer to take out a fighter rather than a heavy attacker or bomber, the P-40 is the decent choice for 700 golden eagles. It's not necessary by any means, but it can function very, very well, and may be able to help you grind out the lower tiers of aircraft too. Next is a pure bomber, the IL-4. It's fairly big and slow, but can carry a loadout of one 1,000kg bomb and two 500kg bombs that drop separately, giving you three very powerful bomb drops. If the skies are relatively clear, you can easily pick up some kills using this thing. It's not amazing, but for 3.0 it'll do the job. Alternatively, you could also take out the DB-3 at 2.7 that functions pretty much the same, minus a defensive 50 cal. 
Next up is a marketplace vehicle, the Tismar. It's hugely functional, but it's also expensive for what it is. It flies very well and comes with two 20mm cannons and two 37mm cannons that can fire armor-piercing rounds. And these rounds can cut through up to 60mm of armor. They can rip through basically every tank in the game top down and they're hugely effective. It can also carry rockets on the wings or two 500kg bombs which drop separately. At 3.7 and tier 3, it's an insanely effective premium. But, at the time of writing, it's on the marketplace for around 20 euros, which is really too expensive for what it is at face value. But, it would be dishonest of me to not bring it up here just based on the price, as it is hugely functional. If it stays around this price and you have the money to play with, it does work great, but if not, just skip this one. It's not worth spending a fortune on if you only want it for Cass. It will work at grinding out the air tree though, so you do have that as well. No matter how I present this, it's going to annoy some people, but if you are thinking of buying it, the sooner the better really. It's an effective vehicle in limited supply, so it will likely never be this cheap again. But please don't think I'm trying to nudge you into buying it with some false sense of urgency. It works great for what it is, but your money can easily be better spent in the tree. It's an objectively great vehicle, but at a heavy price. Next up is the PE2 series. In game there's around 6 of these at different battle ratings with different engines and guns, but they all have basically the same loadout. The PE2 can carry two 500kg bombs or four 250kg bombs and all of these drop separately. And additionally, as the PE2 is a dive bomber, you can aim the bombs accurately in the dive that go exactly where you're pointing, which is really useful. It's not overwhelmingly fast or well defended, but it's still a really effective bomber option. Next up is a fighter, the I-185. It's fairly fast and agile enough, and can carry small rockets, RS or RBS-82s, or two 250kg bombs, which, if you can aim well, will almost guarantee you a ground kill. I'd recommend going with the bombs on this aircraft if you do end up choosing it, as the rockets of this tier do start to struggle a bit. It also comes equipped with three 20mm cannons, which work great against aircraft and tanks too. It does suffer a bit at low speeds and doesn't respond well to taking damage, but overall it's a fairly versatile fighter that you can use to good effect for basically any task. Lastly today is a fairly versatile fighter, the Yak-9T. It's the standard Yak-9 fighter, but with a 37mm cannon in the nose, the same version the Tizmar uses. Using the unlockable AP belt, this cannon can easily cut through basically any enemy tank you'll meet, while also being very manoeuvrable, which lets it easily loop and dive on enemy targets to get some accurate shots. You can really be annoying to the enemy team by just shooting into the engine deck over and over to just disable as many enemies as you can, you can get loads of assists this way. And on top of this, it's a fairly capable fighter too. So, if you're more of a fan of fighter aircraft, this is a really, really good pick. So, there we are guys. Really hope you enjoyed the video. On screen now are the best lineups I think you can make using vehicles from Tier 2. There are a few other lineups you can make, like around 2.7 and 3.0, but these are the most sort of flushed out and reliable lineups I found uh, from using them personally. So uh, yeah, I really hope you enjoyed. Um, sorry this video was obscenely long. You could have done so many things in the time it took to watch this. Um, so I hope it was worth the time. Also, I hope there's no spelling mistakes or anything because I finished editing at the moment. Um, but there's so much footage on the timeline, I think it's about a terabyte's worth, um, that it's basically laggy to the point where I can't change anything anymore. It's having a real strop every time I try and move something. Um, so fingers crossed that it's actually okay. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, really hope you enjoyed. Um, the shop that I have is probably going to be up by the time the next video comes out, hopefully. In a couple of the online communities I'm in, people are saying that the international postal system is a little bit more reliable now to some countries. Um, so hopefully, if it looks like it's going to be reliable and nothing's going to get lost, I will be starting it up again, hopefully. Uh, and there'll be loads of cool stuff on there as well, so hopefully it was worth the wait. Uh, anyway, I will not take up any more of your time and um, let you get on with your day or evening or any of the other various exciting times of day there are. Uh, so yeah, as always, thank you all very, very much for watching, and I will see you next time.